What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I'm your host, JT. Feel good Friday, man. Hope you guys are doing well on this wonderful Friday afternoon. We got a lot of things that we got to talk about on today's episode. Jalen Ramsey, injury impact, AFC North, biggest questions. Why Frank Wright gives the Carolina Panthers a slight edge over the rest of the NFC South. Is the Pac-12 over? We also got some more conference realignment rumors. Reportedly, Florida State is looking to leave the ACC and hopes to join either the Big Ten or the SEC conference. Going to be giving my thoughts on that and a couple of more things as well. Before we get into it, if you're new and you haven't already, make sure that you go ahead, like the video, subscribe to the channel. We go live every day, Monday through Friday. Listen to the JT Sports Podcast. We're not just available on YouTube. You can find us on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from, you can find the JT Sports Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, rate us five stars. We are trying to get to 100 five-star reviews before the start of the college football season. So go ahead, make sure that you give us a five-star review on all podcasting platforms. All you got to do is go to whichever podcasting service you use, type in the JT Sports Podcast, and it will pop up. Or you can go down to the description down below, scroll down a little bit, and there will be the links to the Apple and Spotify versions of the podcast. What's going to be the impact of Jalen Ramsey's meniscus injury? Now, he just got surgery for it this morning, and he's going to be out of action until the late part of the season. He's expected to return in December. Now, Miami Dolphins fans, this is not the end of the season for you guys. Just because Jalen Ramsey's going to miss the majority of this year doesn't mean that your secondary or your cornerback position is going to be a liability because you have a really good cornerback who should be replacing Jalen Ramsey and rookie cornerback Cam Smith. Now, he was drafted in the second round from this past year's NFL draft out of South Carolina and He was really good. He is a really good athlete, has very good measurables for the position, really aggressive, physical corner, and sometimes his physicality can cost him at times. He got penalized a good amount of times during his final season with the Gamecocks. But with Vic Vangio playing under his system and his tutelage as the DC, I think he's going to be able to elevate Cam Smith and he could potentially be a really good cornerback as a rookie. And I was talking to a scout, my guy Artie, who works for Film is an Art. He says that Cam Smith should give you the equivalent to what you expect from a first-round cornerback playing in his first season. So Cam Smith most likely should be the player who ends up replacing Jalen Ramsey. But if they don't want to go with him, I think their next best options in free agency are either to sign Byron Jones back to the team or bring in Eli Apple. And for those of you guys who say, ew, JT, Eli Apple? Come, come on, on now, dog. You finna make us Come like on, Eli man. Apple? I'm not saying that you guys should bring in Eli Apple, but compared to what else is out there on the cornerback market, these are the two best available options. And Eli Apple is in a bad corner. He was pretty solid for the Cincinnati Bengals. It's just that in certain moments, he got exposed and a lot of people were watching. But he was actually pretty good for the Cincinnati Bengals. But if you're the Miami Dolphins, I think that if you have to start Cam Smith, I don't think you would be in a bad situation. Yes, he's a rookie and he has to prove himself, but he has great ball skills. He's long, rangy. So, I think that he can be solid this year in replace of Ramsey until he returns. And hopefully by the time Jalen Ramsey is back on the field, you should be in the playoff conversation. Maybe by this point when Ramsey comes back, you already have a playoff spot secured. So maybe you don't have to rush him back into injury. But the Miami Dolphins are expected to be legitimate contenders in the AFC this year. So regardless of when he comes back, Most people expect them to be in the thick of the playoff conversation. Now, with him coming back late season, you're going to have him ready for when 
you plan on making that late playoff push. So Jalen Ramsey, he's going to miss a significant amount of time for the Miami Dolphins this year. I think that his impact is going to be pretty significant, but Cam Smith should provide you with serviceable cornerback play. Biggest questions for all four teams in the AFC North going into this year. We got to start off with the Cincinnati Bengals. How is Joe Burrow going to look after that calf strain because I just got done watching the video for the millionth time before recording and it was really ugly to watch is it going to hinder his play is his mobility going to be a little bit stunted how is Joe Burrow going to look coming off that calf strain second question that I have for the Cincinnati Bengals this year is going to be how good is the right tackle play going to be Right tackle was not a good position for you on the offensive line last year. You spent a lot of money to get Lyle Collins in free agency, and he did not deliver. Um, and also, he got injured right before the playoffs. Now, Jonah Williams is going to end up starting at right tackle for Cincinnati this year, but he could potentially lose that job. If Lyle Collins gets back and ends up finding a way to crack back into the starting lineup because Jonah Williams has poor play, you got to remember this was somebody who was a former first round pick coming out of Alabama. He has been one of the worst left tackles in the NFL. He gave up seven sacks last year. So they're trying to try him out at right tackle. They tried to move him. Nobody wanted him. And Lyle Collins, he currently is on PUP to start training camp. So right now, it looks like Jonah Williams is the favorite to win that right tackle job. But if he struggles throughout the season, we most likely will see Lyle Collins replacing him. Now, Cody Ford, they signed him. He's a swing tackle, but he hasn't really been that good. He can also play a little bit of guard as well, but he pretty much has been just good death at this point, and it remains to be seen if he's even going to be able to make the roster. Biggest questions for the Baltimore Ravens. We got to ask ourselves, you have a new offensive coordinator. Todd Monk is replacing Greg Roman. Is this passing attack going to mesh right away or is it going to take a little bit of time for obj zay flowers to get on the same page with lamar jackson now i believe that this passing offense is going to have a lot of success but there's a lot of skepticism about the baltimore ravens making this decision to switch things up offensively because they've had so much success with what they've done over the last couple of years with Greg Roman. So them taking a different approach on offense is going to be really interesting to watch to see how Lamar Jackson handles more responsibilities in the passing game. And plus, how is Lamar Jackson going to perform with a legitimate group of wide receivers and the offensive coordinator who's going to bring a little bit more to the table when it comes to passing concepts in the passing game. The next thing for the Baltimore Ravens is on the defensive line. Justin Houston is still a free agent. You can bring him back, but he was your most productive pass rusher last season. You got rid of Calais Campbell. He's with the Falcons. You're looking at David Ajabo or also Odafi Owe for being able to step up for you this year and giving you serviceable pass rush production. Now, David Ajabo, he suffered a injury during the drive process last year that kept him out of the majority of his rookie season. So last year was pretty much a red shirt year for him. This is pretty much his rookie season. And he had a lot of hype coming out of Michigan. He was expected to be a top 15 pick, but the injury that he suffered during the drive process caused his draft stock to fall into the second round. You got Adolfi Owe, who was a first round pick not too long ago, very athletic, has a lot of upside, but he hasn't really shown a lot of flashes. And this is a make or break year for him. And if he doesn't end up delivering this year and David Ajabo also doesn't end up doing much, this is going to be a little bit of a disappointment when you're looking at how this Ravens defense could perform this year. This is a defense that could be top five this year, depending on how much they get from the pass rushing position. Travis Jones, interior defense alignment, 
was somebody who was getting a lot of hype around this time last year. Not too many people are talking about him. He could be a breakout player to watch on that defensive line. He's a very good pass rusher to be a defensive tackle. Now, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, what is Kenny Pickett going to look like going into his second season? Now, a lot of the Pittsburgh Steelers fan base expects and believes that Kenny Pickett is going to be improved this year, but it's still a big question mark because you never know with these things. Not everything is a guarantee. Some of these quarterbacks can put in all the work they want to and the results still not show on the field. The second biggest question for the Steelers is, how is Matt Canada's play calling going to look this year? His play calling wasn't good last year. It was heavily criticized by the Steelers Nate face by the Steelers faithful and Mike Tomlin decided to bring him back and I'm guessing the reason why he brought back Matt Canada is because when you have multiple offensive coordinator changes throughout a young quarterback's first four years in the league it kind of hinders his development it makes things harder for him versus keeping him in the same system with the same offensive coordinator so for Kenny Pickett to have a better chance of having success Mike Tomlin felt it was best for him to remain with Matt Canada calling the shots on offense. Now, if Matt Canada delivers and he improves his play calling, then hopefully the Pittsburgh Steelers offense could end up being one of the better units in the league. But if the play calling continues to struggle or not be all that great like how it has been the last couple of years, then Kenny Pickett, his development could be hindered a little bit. And my biggest questions for the Cleveland Browns going into this year is, first of all, how is Deshaun Watson going to look this year? He was really rusty last year. He had a lot of distractions that probably messed with his preparation for the start of the season. And when he came off that suspension, that was his first time really having full speed in-game action for the first time in nearly two years. So how is he going to look year two under this system and for Deshaun Watson he's getting paid a lot of money a lot of guaranteed money the largest guaranteed salary in NFL history so he has to deliver this year because if he doesn't the Browns are not going to have a chance at being able to win this division this division already has two of the best QBs in the game in Lamar Jackson and Joe Burrow Kenny Pickett he's in ascension mode right now if the Browns can't get competent quarterback play this year, without a doubt, they're going to be the worst team in this division. Secondly, how improved is the run defense going to be for Cleveland this season? The run defense was not good. They bring in new defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz, and they brought in a lot of talent and depth on the interior defensive line. You signed Maurice Hurst in free agency, Tristan Hill. You also paid Dalvin Tomlinson, a pretty lofty contract so that run defense should be a lot better than what it was last season but you can't be a playoff team in the AFC North with solid or below average run defense you need good run defense if you want to be able to survive in this division the Ravens Steelers Bengals all have really good running back play and they are all capable of being able to gash you in the run game. So if the Browns struggle against the run, they probably won't have much success in the AFC North this year. So these are my biggest questions for all four teams in the AFC North going into the upcoming NFL season. Let me know some of the biggest questions that you have for the teams in the AFC North down in the comment section down below. Before we move on, I got to put my phone on silent real quick. And if you haven't already, make sure that you leave a like, subscribe to the channel. We go live every day, Monday through Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Remember that you can listen to the audio version of the podcast available on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from, you can find the JT Sports Podcast. Follow us on Instagram and X. Our Instagram is at JT Sports underscore. Our Twitter handle X is at JT Sports underscore underscore. So make sure to go ahead, give us a follow on there.
All right. Green Bay Packers outlook for the 2023 NFL season. How good are the Green Bay Packers going to be this year? It's the start of the Jordan Love era. Aaron Rodgers is gone. What do you have in Jordan Love? Now, there are a lot of doubters and detractors of Jordan Love. I'm not one of them. I also, however, don't happen to be a big believer in Jordan Love. Now, I don't think Jordan Love is going to be garbage. I think he's going to be a middle-of-the-pack quarterback. I feel like in certain games, he's going to be really good, but he also is going to have a high tendency to struggle taking care of the football. I think he can be a lot similar to Jameis Winston in some capacity. So when it comes to how Jordan Love how Jordan Love's performance is going to affect the Green Bay Packers this year if he plays well this potentially could be a borderline playoff team they got a really good offensive line plus they got tons of depth you got a really good group of wide receivers you drafted Jaden Reed in this past year's NFL draft out of Michigan State he was one of my favorite wide receivers coming out. This dude's going to be a monster with the other two studs. You got that receiver and Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs. And you got Luke Musgrave at tight end as well. He was also a really good pickup by the Green Bay Packers in this past year's draft. So Jordan Love, he kind of has a situation that it's kind of hard for him to fail. Honestly, there's way too much talent around him. For him to be a garbage quarterback. I think Jordan Love should at least be a top 16 quarterback this year. Even though he's going to be a turnover machine in my opinion. I still think that he's going to be good enough to win you a good amount of games. With the talent that he has around him. It's not like he's going to one of the worst situations in the NFL. He's going to a team that has a really good coaching staff, a team that has allowed him to sit behind one of the greatest quarterbacks ever for his first couple of years. And he looked pretty good against the Philadelphia Eagles. He looked way better in his start against them than what he did the first time we saw him start against the Kansas City Chiefs a long time ago. So I've seen massive improvement from Jordan Love, but I still think that he's going to be really, really turnover prone. And this defense, you got concerns with Joe Barry if you are a Packers fan. Now, this defense has tons of talent. You look at their defensive line, it's really good. Their linebacker unit, I'm a really big believer. And who's number seven? Quay Walker, I believe that's his name. I really like his game. I was a big fan of him coming out of Georgia. In the secondary you have Jair Alexander, Russell Douglas as your two cornerbacks. Jair Alexander is coming off a really good season. So there's a lot of talent there for Joe Barry to have success. And then you're going to have 100% of Rashawn Gary this year. Rashawn Gary was having an outstanding season last year until he suffered that season-ending injury that sidelined him. Rashawn Gary, I think, is kind of a little bit of a sleeper pick. For Defensive Player of the Year this year, I don't think enough people know how good Rashawn Gary truly is. And with the talent that they have on the defensive line, I think that Green Bay's front seven could be really nasty this year. And if this front seven ends up improving against the run, this is going to be one of the better defenses in the NFC this year. Now, Jordan Love and Joe Barry are two of the most important factors to the Green Bay Packers being able to have a successful season. Now, I think the best case scenario for the Packers this year would be 10 to 11 wins. Let's say Jordan Love plays okay or he plays better than expected. The Packers probably could win this division. The Detroit Lions do have a really good team. The Minnesota Vikings are a little eh. The Green Bay Packers, I think this roster is being a little bit overlooked. This is a really good team. They don't really have a lot of question marks. Now, they have some positions that they could be better at, but they don't really have anything that you go, that you look at and say, oh, yeah, that's a big area of concern other than Jordan Love. And once again, as I stated earlier, the situation that Jordan Love has is probably the best situation that a guy like him can be in. This transition 
should not be all that difficult. Of course, nobody's going to expect Jordan Love to play like Aaron Rodgers. And I think that Packers fans have pretty tempered expectations when it comes to what they're expecting out of Jordan Love from a performance standpoint this year. There aren't Packers fans who are standing on top of rooftops and yelling, Jordan Love is going to be the next coming of Aaron Rodgers. Jordan Love is going to be an MVP candidate. Like how they were doing with Trey Lance around this time last offseason. Jordan Love, the expectations are pretty moderate for him. Based on how Aaron Rodgers played last season, the bar isn't set too high. This is a guy who has a really good arm. He's going to take a lot of shots downfield, something that Aaron Rodgers didn't do a bunch of in the Packers offense last season. So I think that Jordan Love, he's going to be pretty solid. And I think he has the potential to be a really good quarterback depending on how well he takes care of the football. But I kind of have a strong suspicion that he's going to be really turnover prone like Jameis Winston. And when you look at this division, I don't think this division is the toughest, but I don't think it's the easiest neither. If this run defense doesn't improve, you're going to get ran all over by the Chicago Bears. You're going to get ran all over by the Detroit Lions, who have two really good backs in Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery and a really good offensive line. So the Packers... They really do need this run defense to step up and be really good. And for their head coach, Coach LaFleur, you know, this is kind of a prove-it year for him because his last couple of seasons, he's had Aaron Rodgers as his quarterback. And anytime you have a great quarterback as a head coach, it makes things a lot easier for you because There's so much that you have to do when you're trying to develop a young quarterback. You got to make sure he's comfortable in the offense. You got to make sure that he's developing good rapport and chemistry with his wide receivers. And when you look at Matt LaFleur, the fact that he's had the luxury of coaching one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play this game, we really don't know just how good of a coach he is. Now, we know he's a solid coach, but even with a solid coach, A great quarterback can win a lot of games with you and have a good amount of success, i.e. Deshaun Watson with Bill O'Brien and Aaron Rodgers with the previous head coach and Mike McCarthy. So if Jordan Love ends up panning out, it's going to be a really good look for Matt LaFleur. But if he doesn't end up panning out and he ends up struggling, it's going to look like a really bad decision when the Packers ended up trading back into the first round to drive Jordan Love. I think we kind of forget that. We forget that instead of trading back into the first round for a good wide receiver, they opt to drive Aaron Rodgers' replacement. And there's no excuses for Jordan Love not to work out. He has a great situation. This is a really good team. They got solid playmakers around them, a good offensive line. You're going to have a good run game. So there's no reason why Jordan Love should struggle. Now for this defense, with Joe Barry calling the plays, I really don't know. Honestly, I don't really have a lot of confidence in him. And a lot of the Packers faithful, they don't really believe in him all that much neither. But you're kind of hoping that the talent kind of just takes over. Kenny Clark, Devontae Wyatt are really good. Preston Smith is still very productive. Lucas Van Ness rookie out of Iowa this is a guy who kind of fits the mold for a Green Bay Packer and the Packers do do a pretty good job at drafting interior and defensive linemen so I think that the Green Bay Packers overall going into this season they're going to be a team that is going to be a lot like what they were last year in the middle of the pack I don't think they're going to be awful I think Worst case scenario, six wins. Best case, they can get the six. But I think they probably will be around the seven, maybe eight win team this year. Jordan Love, I don't think he's going to be bad. I think he's going to have some great moments. But I think he's going to be heavy with the turnovers. I don't think he's going to have great ball security. That's something that kind of concerns me. Even when I was watching him in the preseason, the ball security wasn't the greatest. So, Let me know what are your thoughts on the Green Bay Packers going into the 2023 NFL season. 
down in the comment section down below. The NFC South is one of the worst divisions in the NFL this year. And I think that Frank Wright gives the Carolina Panthers a slight edge to win this division. Now, everybody's looking at the New Orleans Saints and the Atlanta Falcons for the two teams who have the best chances of capturing this division title. But what a lot of people seem to overlook is the impact of coaching. Again, I know if you're a Saints fan, you don't want to talk about who your head coach is because he isn't a good one. He hasn't proven that he's able to lead a playoff caliber football team to even a winning record. And even though he does have Derek Carr, Derek Carr isn't going to be enough to make this team a playoff caliber football team if they can't have great coaching. And Dennis Allen, so far throughout his coaching career, he's yet to produce a winning record. And when you look at the majority of head coaches in the league, it doesn't take too long to find out who's a good coach and who's a bad coach. When you get to your first three seasons, four seasons, and you still have a losing record, you're not a good coach. Nobody is a Bill Belichick. There's only one Bill Belichick. Nobody is Pete Carroll. There's only one Pete Carroll. There are way more coaching hires that end up backfiring when it comes to second chance head coaches than they are head coaches that succeed who are rookie coaches who've never been head coaches before. Second chance head coaches don't really have a promising track record of being able to deliver their second go around. Frank Wright is different though. When you look at Frank Wright, what makes him different from Dennis Allen is that this is somebody who coming into his second job actually has a winning record. He's guided his former team to the postseason in the Indianapolis Colts with Phillip Rivers. He has a really good track record at getting the most out of the quarterback position, minus what happened last season in Indy. Dennis Allen, his defenses are really good, but outside of that, he's kind of inept at anything else. And some guys are just really good coordinators and aren't just cut out to be head coaches, and Dennis Allen might be one of those guys. So when I look at the New Orleans Saints, I say, yeah, you got a more talented roster than Carolina, but you have probably the worst coach in the division and Dennis Allen. Same thing with Tar Bowles. I don't think the Buccaneers have a god-awful roster. If they had a better coach, I think they could be a sleeper team. But they got Tar Bowles, who hasn't really had any success, minus that one 10 win season that he had as the head coach with the New York Jets. Outside of that, He's been awful as a head coach. And even last season, the Buccaneers made it to the playoffs, but I think it was more due to Tom Brady than it was Todd Bowles. This was the same head coach who called a fake punt up multiple possessions the first drive of halftime on his own side of the field, and it didn't work out. A fake punt. So when I'm looking at Frank Wright compared to the other coaches in the NFC South, he has not just a better track record, but he's also a proven winner. None of these head coaches have proven to be able to guide or be a great leader for a winning caliber football team. You look at Ty Bowles, only one winning season with the New York Jets. The Buccaneers were a massive disappointment last year. They went to the postseason. They won this division, but it wasn't saying much given the fact that he took over a team that was in the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. And you got the greatest quarterback of all time, Arthur Smith. We don't even know about him yet. This is his make or break year. This is the year that we're going to find out everything we need to know about if Arthur Smith has what it takes to be a head coach in this league. And when you look at Dennis Allen, he didn't win when he was with the Raiders and he didn't win his first season as the head coach with New Orleans. We've already seen a good sample size of Dennis Allen as a head coach. And based on history, he isn't going to work out. Frank Wright is a winner. He's proven. And remember Doug Peterson and Jacksonville with Trevor Lawrence? Although this isn't the same exact situation, Frank Wright isn't as good as a head coach as Doug Peterson. Frank Wright is a pretty solid head coach. And solid head coaches and weak divisions, more times than not, if they get solid quarterback play, they end up winning these divisions. Remember Bill O'Brien when he was the head coach of the Houston Texans and he had Deshaun Watson? The AFC South was down those years. 
So if you got a capable quarterback and you are a capable head coach, more times than not, you're going to be able to win the division that's as bad as what the NFC South is going into this season with two bad coaches that got two losing records and the head coach in Arthur Smith who is entering his make-or-break season. Frank Wright is going to have the Carolina Panthers prepared. They're going to be better well-coached. And they're going to be better in late-game situations. Dennis Allen isn't good with the clock. He isn't good in fourth-down situations. A lot of Saints fans have called him out for being super conservative. You look at Frank Wright, this is somebody who was fired, not because he was a bad coach, but simply because Indianapolis kept playing musical chairs with the quarterback position. Oh, they got a rookie quarterback. When you got a great head coach or a solid head coach, the quarterback is going to be solid. Frank Wright is an offensive-minded head coach. Offensive-minded coaches are taking over the league. And anytime you got a young QB with the offensive-minded head coach, normally it ends up working out. So Bryce Young, what was different about him compared to the other QBs in the draft that got taken after him? His processing, how well he's able to understand and read defenses. He's already learning a good amount of the playbook and, you know, he's kind of ahead of pace. He's already won the starting job over Andy Dalton right after minicamp. He was announced a starter the first day of training camp by Frank Wright. So Bryce Young, this is somebody who was insanely talented coming out of Alabama, former Heisman winner. He's going to a situation that has a good head coach that knows offense, that's going to put him in situations to succeed. He has a solid team around him. I trust the Panthers and Frank Wright more than I trust any other team in this division. I'm not going to put my faith in the team that has a head coach with the losing record. A lot of people have to stop overlooking the impact of a head coach. These head coaches just don't win games because they got great teams. You remember all those years the Dallas Cowboys were going 8-8 eight and eight with the master clapper, Jason Garrett? The reason why was because Jason Garrett was just a bad head coach. Bad head coaches underachieve. Great head coaches win championships. It's simple. And when you got a bad head coach that constantly underachieves and doesn't meet expectations compared to a guy like Frank Wright that has delivered, compare his resume to Dennis Allen. If you're a Saints fan, who would you rather have, Frank Wright or Dennis Allen today as your head coach? Nearly every team in the NFC South will probably choose Frank Wright over their current head coach. You want to know why? Because he's proven. And when you got the best head coach in the division, it always gives you an opportunity to have a shot at winning the title when you're in these kinds of weak divisions. Now, if the Panthers were in the AFC West or the AFC East, it would be a different story because then coaching wouldn't be enough to get you over the top because you're going against other teams that have great coaching plus better rosters than you. But you're going against the NFC South where your roster is pretty average and the majority of these other teams minus the Saints have average to maybe slightly above average rosters the only reason i don't include the saints is because their roster actually is really good and if they had a head coach that was better than dennis allen i would have them as a lock to win this division if they had sean payton as their head coach i would have them as a dark horse super bowl contender but they don't they have dennis allen and he's not good so i think that frank wright gives the Panthers a little bit of an edge when it comes to winning the NFC South. What's next for the Pac-12 after losing Colorado to the Big 12? Now, they issued a statement last night, and they pretty much said that, you know, they're not going anywhere. They're going to look at all possible options. Oregon State just came out recently and said that they still believe in the Pac-12. They're not going anywhere. But it's like, what's next? For Oregon and Washington though because we already know how the Big 12 has this infatuation with the four corner schools Colorado Utah Arizona Arizona State and according to some rumors out there Arizona is probably the next thing cooking out of the Pac-12 headed to the Big 12 due to how good they are in basketball and when we're looking at Oregon and Washington 
I mean, after UCLA and USC leads for the Big Ten and Colorado leads for the Big 12, I mean, what value does this conference really have for schools like them? And the Pac-12 right now is struggling to get a new media rights deal. Nobody even wants to pay all the money it costs to air these Pac-12 games compared to the kind of deals that schools got in the Big Ten and the SEC and the Big 12. And when you are ESPN and the Pac-12 commissioner is coming at you trying to negotiate a deal, you're like, sir, who do you have in this conference who people really want to watch? Let's be honest. Outside of Oregon and Washington, there's nobody else who you want to watch in the Pac-12. Colorado with Deion Sanders is... It's, It's the Big 12 now. So you don't have that anymore. So what's the appeal? And if you take Oregon and Washington out the equation, this conference is nothing, absolutely nothing. The only thing keeping the Pac-12 alive right now, in my opinion, is the fact that they still do have Oregon and Washington. But I think they could be leaving for the Big 10. I don't get why the Big 10 wouldn't give them membership and it strengthens their conference. Yeah, you'll have to make it work with the time zones and whatnot. You'll be adding some more Pac-12 schools, but why not? If the Big 12 is going to continue to expand and they get all four of those corner schools like they want, you're going to have to expand. And the SEC, they might start expanding again. So it's kind of like when one conference starts expanding and the other stops, somebody else starts up again. The Pac-12, for them to stay around, I think they got to keep Oregon and Washington. Now, getting Boise and getting a San Diego State, I don't think that really helps you any much. It helps you keep more depth around your conference. It helps you keep more teams in this conference, I mean. But it doesn't really make you a more legitimate conference than what you were prior to adding them. Those schools are not going to really bring anything crazy to your conference. And nobody's going to want to watch Boise and... San Diego State on national television. No disrespect to those fan bases, but nobody really is going to be infatuated with watching San Diego State in Boise late night. And I think there's a reason why they got this Pac-12 after dark. You mean to tell me that the only way we can watch Washington and Oregon State play is by staying up to 1 p.m. or 1 a.m. in the morning to watch the games finish? Come on, man. And When I'm looking at the Big Ten, I mean, the Big Ten right now, outside of UCLA and USC, they haven't made any other moves. But I definitely think that if Washington and Oregon still are open to leaving the Pac-12, if you're the Big Ten, why wouldn't you add them? Two really good media markets, two really good programs, not just in college football, but in college basketball as well. They got pretty solid basketball programs. I don't think it wouldn't make sense for the Big Ten to add Washington and Oregon to their conference. And Oregon State, if you're Oregon, why not bring your rival along? Isn't that how it went with USC on their move to the Big Ten? It was like, you know what? We're going to move to the Big Ten, but we're going to bring our rival with us. And why wouldn't you want to bring that rivalry to the Big Ten if you're their commissioner? Oregon State and Oregon is a really underrated rivalry that a lot of people sleep on. Because the Pac-12 is a conference that not a lot of people watch or pay a lot of attention to. So putting those schools in the Big Ten will put a major national media spotlight on them. And for the four corner schools, Colorado's in the Big 12 now. But Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, are they going to stay in the Pac-12? Utah, I think they will fit in very perfectly in the Big 12. I would love to see them in the Big 12. I also wouldn't have a problem seeing Utah in the Big 10. When you watch Utah play, don't they kind of remind you of a Big 10 football team? Tough, physical, love to run the football down your throat, tough quarterback play, tough defense. I think they could be a very good fit in the Big 10. But if I had to tell you guys who I believe is most likely going to leave next, I think it's going to be Arizona or one of those four corner schools. I think that the Oregons and the Washingtons of the world are kind of waiting to make a big move. 
Now, when those two schools leave or if they leave, I think this conference is officially done. I really think those are the only two schools keeping this conference around. Then if you're a Pac-12 truther, there's no way you can convince anybody that Boise and San Diego State and SMU are going to be enough to have this conference still viewed as a P5 conference. I'm sorry, but there's not a lot of death in the Pac-12. There already wasn't a lot of death in the Pac-12 anyway. With Stanford being down, Stanford, USC used to always be on ESPN and never after 10 p.m. at night. You used to always see some of the best Pac-12 teams playing at pretty reasonable time slots. No later than 8 on Fox or, you know, 6 on ABC. The Pac-12, I think it's pretty much all but done. At least as a legitimate Power 5 conference. You keep Oregon State around and you lose Washington and Oregon, you're pretty much a better version of the Mountain West. You might as well go ahead and take those teams also. With the Pac-12, it's like you can add all the schools you want to to expand, but it doesn't matter if they're not big brands. You lose USC, you got to bring in a brand that's just as big or two schools that kind of can make up for it. Cincinnati lost Texas and Oklahoma. They brought in Cincinnati, BYU, Colorado, Houston, and UCF. What has has the Pac-12 done? Same thing with the ACC. The Pac-12 hasn't really been able to be on the aggressive. And you had Deion Sanders there. And you still couldn't get a media rights deal negotiated? I mean, we don't know who's going to end up having the rights to show Pac-12 games. A couple months ago, I thought it was going to be Amazon. Now we don't know who the hell it's going to be. I think the Pac-12 is just a dying conference. I think it's done. You ask me who's leaving next? Oregon, Washington, Big Ten. Come on, Big Ten, what are you waiting for? I would love to see Oregon and Ohio State every single year. Washington versus Michigan would be a really interesting matchup. Washington versus Maryland. There are a lot of potential Great matchups that we could witness in the Big Ten this year or next season if Oregon and Washington were to join. But I think that the Pac-12 is kind of done, man. I don't know why people still think there's a little bit of hope for the Pac-12 to survive. Like, you lost USC and UCLA, fam. And you just lost Colorado. This is the beginning to the end. Pac-12 know it. Oregon State issue in the statement because who's interested in Oregon State? The football program has been down for most of the past decade, and their basketball team doesn't really do anything either. Nobody's going to be chomping at the bit to watch an Oregon State game. No offense to Oregon State, but it's just that you're not a national brand. You're not the kind of brand that, you know, galvanizes ratings, at least yet. But let me know who you guys think is going to be the next team to leave the Pac-12 and what's next for the Pac-12 conference. There's a rumor floating around that Florida State is looking to leave the ACC and could potentially be eyeballing a move to the SEC or the Big Ten. Now, if this happens, this would be devastating to the ACC. Because first of all, if Florida State leaves, why wouldn't Clemson leave? And I believe the reason for Florida State wanting to leave the ACC is because of money. They look at UCF and they're like, there's no freaking way that UCF is getting more money a year than what we're getting from our media rights deal. There's no way, ACC. You got to make it right. We're Florida freaking state. They are UCF. We're the Seminoles. We're one of the most iconic teams in the history of college football. What kind of synonymous with college football history? So for a school like UCF, To be getting more a year than us, you got to fix it. And they got a point with that. They do. You can't fault them for that. If you are somebody who is against expansion and you always get mad when a team thinks about leaving the conference, you got to understand that money means a lot in college football. With money, you can expand your facilities, put more into the football program and help out the school, et cetera, et cetera. And when you got schools like UCF getting more than You and you're a bigger brand, a bigger name. Your name holds more weight in the college football landscape. Of course, you're going to want to 
get those kinds of dollars. Of course, there's going to be a sense of entitlement there, and it should. And the reports are also saying that if Florida State leaves, Clemson is right behind them. And Clemson, same way. Now, although Clemson, I don't think they're the kind of blue blood that Florida State is. I don't even think you can consider Clemson a blue blood. I would consider Clemson to be a new blood. But Florida State leaves, you know Clemson is right behind them. Because, yeah, they don't have the history that Florida State has, but they do have a lot of history stemming from this past decade with two national championships. They're a school that a lot of people like to watch. They have a really big fan base. They draw a lot of ratings when they play. So if FSU leaves the ACC, who's going to take them, the Big Ten or the SEC? Now, if we're doing this based off location and geography, Florida State and Clemson should be in the SEC. Now, the SEC probably might push against accepting Clemson because, you know, they already got South Carolina. And South Carolina kind of already has been doing a little bit of player hating and whispering from the sidelines. They wouldn't really be a big fan of Clemson joining the SEC. Now, I don't get why they would be upset against that because that would just be more money for them. All right, but okay, they don't want them in the SEC. Cool, Texas and them is in the SEC now, and so is Texas eventually. So Florida State, they join the SEC. We get to see them in Florida. And then imagine if we can bring Miami along. The SEC could potentially have all three Florida schools. Do you not know how big that would be for them? And the Southeastern Conference and all the conference realignment chaos going on, we could actually have one conference in it all that actually somewhat kind of sticks to geography, at least a little bit. Now, going to the Big Ten, I don't know how that will work out for Florida State. I think they would be a much better fit in the SEC. Don't y'all think? Because FSU in the Big Ten, I don't really see how it works. Honestly, like the Big Ten is kind of like middle of the country, you know, maybe West Coast now with UCLA and USC, but with them adding FSU, I th I just think it's a weird fit. I just think it doesn't fit right. And Florida State going against Ohio State, Michigan, I just don't think it hits the same. I would much rather see Florida and FSU every year versus seeing Florida State and Michigan or Florida State and Penn State or FSU and Iowa. You feel me? Like, I feel like those middle of the portion country teams should be going to the Big Ten. The teams that are located on the southern part of the border or the southern part of the United States should be playing in the SEC or the Big 12. That's just my opinion. You guys can debate about that all you want to, but that's just my opinion. That's how I feel it should go. And the SEC already has Florida. You had FSU. Why wouldn't they want to bring Miami along? It's more money. You could have three of the biggest schools in Florida. I don't get why the SEC wouldn't take FSU. Like I said, them in the Big Ten, I just think it's a little weird. Honestly, I don't really think there's any Big Ten games I'll watch and be like, oh, like FSU and Michigan? Like, hell yeah, I got to watch it. Like, ah, I mean, they, they would be two of the best schools in the Big Ten, but... They wouldn't really, really gauge my interest. I like Ohio State and Michigan, not just because of the rivalry and the history that it has, but because of the playing styles of the two schools. They're just completely polar opposites. You look at Michigan and Penn State, that's a good rivalry, you know? But you look at FSU, Michigan, I, I just don't know, man. It, it's just a personal thing to me. I would much rather see FSU versus Bama or FSU versus Tennessee or Clemson versus Tennessee you feel me like these matchups just hit a little bit better don't you think so FSU if they are planning on exiting the ACC to get more money I think that the SEC will be a way better option for them and if they can't get into the SEC what's wrong with taking Clemson along with you to maybe the Big 12 or maybe you can end up forming your own conference. I read something before this called the Significant Seven. They pretty much could form their own conference. Now, I don't know how the hell that will work. What would be the process for that? But that would be interesting. 
But then all in all, FSU reportedly is looking to leave the ACC, the Atlantic Coastal Conference. There are teams that are making way more than Florida State that shouldn't be. They got a right to leave this conference. And if they have to pick between the SEC and the Big Ten, I think that the SEC would be the best landing spot for them. Year one expectations for Matt Rule. What are you expecting out of Nebraska entering year one of the Matt Rule era? Now, looking at this team overall as a whole, I don't think they're all that talented. Honestly, I don't think Matt Rule is going into a situation where he just has all the talent to have a Brian Kelly kind of first season. You got to remember that Brian Kelly, even though he had a successful first year at LSU, he hit the transfer portal really hard. Matt Rule didn't really hit the portal with that level of intensity. They utilized the transfer portal, but they didn't have a drastic influx of transfers coming in. And when I look at this defense, this defensive line really concerns me. They're expected to be starting two, two true freshmen on the defensive line. And their linebacker unit is really good. Their secondary is solid. They got a couple of good players in the back end. But overall, you know, this is a team that has a lot of improvement that has to be made. I think at best they could potentially end up winning seven games, maybe eight due to how good and dynamic they can be on offense with Jeff Sims at quarterback. Jeff Sims, if you guys didn't watch him play at Georgia Tech, go watch some highlights. This dude was a really good player. Not great, but a really good player who was kind of held back in a bad situation in a toxic environment. Nebraska has a solid group of wide receivers, a better group of wide receivers than what you may think. Their running back unit is also really good. And... If you're a Cornhuskers fan, something that should have you really optimistic this season is that your rushing attack should be way better than what it was last season. With having Jeff Sims back there and the talent that you got back there at running back, that should automatically make you one of the best rushing teams in the Big Ten because you're going to have the rushing ability of Jeff Sims plus two other talented backs in the backfield. Wide receiver, you're solid there. So I think offensively, when you look at how this offensive line is expected to play, Nebraska's offensive line hasn't played at a good level for the last couple of years. But the coaching staff, over the course of the spring, they've said that this offensive line has made gradual improvements, and this offensive line should be improved slightly this season. At least that's what the overall tone sounds like to me when it comes to reading and hearing comments from the coaching staff about the performance that they are expecting to get from their offensive line this year. I really think when you look at Jeff Sims, the fact that he's able to make something out of nothing, he has a lot of athleticism. He was a four-star recruit coming out of Sandalwood, and he was a big get for Georgia Tech. They were really excited about him, and he had some really good moments. And you remember what Matt Rule did with Jerry Bohannon. There are people who push back against me on this, but Jerry Bohannon, I don't think he was dirt. With Matt Rule there, I think he was pretty solid. And I think Matt Rule got the most out of Jerry Bohannon, at least when he was the head coach there. You look at Jeff Sims. This is somebody that still has a good amount of development that needs to be made, but he has way more upside than Jerry Bohannon. He's a way better athlete and has a way stronger arm. And Jeff Sims was Georgia Tech's best player at times when he was playing last season. So when I'm looking at Nebraska, I think with Jeff Sims at quarterback, I think he makes them very intriguing. If they didn't have him at quarterback and they had somebody else that didn't really have the kind of dynamic running ability he possesses, I don't think I feel the same way about them. And Nebraska under Scott Frost you know, they went through some pretty rough patches. Their offensive line was dreadful under him, and they weren't really all that great offensively. They finally got competent quarterback play out of Casey Thompson last year. And Casey Thompson wasn't even bad. He was pretty good. And when you're looking at Jeff Sims, I think you're getting somebody who has the capability of being one of those players that can elevate your team. Similar to what Jaden Daniels did last season with LSU. He was carrying LSU on his back. Honestly, when you think of LSU football, 
outside of Brian Kelly, you were thinking about Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels had some really great performances, some Heisman worthy performances, I should add. And it was a pretty good bounce back story. And the same thing could happen with Jeff Sims and Matt Rule. Matt Rule is looking for redemption. You know, had a lot of success in the Big 12 at Baylor, leaves the college ranks for the NFL, doesn't work out, makes a big return to college football at a program that has a lot of history of being successful but has been down. Matt Rule could be the savior of Nebraska. And Jeff Sims is looking for a second opportunity after it not working out at Georgia Tech, a friend, uh, a team that had a lot of promise at one point. So I think that Nebraska, best case scenario, I think they end up winning eight games. I think that eight wins is realistic. You know, early in the season, you're going to be playing Colorado. I think that's going to be a really intriguing matchup. Because you got two programs that they don't really know where they're at from, you know, how good they truly are in terms of being able to compete in their conference. You know, you got teams that are hopeful that they can compete, but realistically, at best, they're going to be middle of the pack teams. And for schools like Colorado, Nebraska, both having new coaching staffs, having concerns that a good amount of positions. This is going to be a good test for Nebraska to see where they stand. Now, you got to play Illinois. I think Illinois is going to be a really tough game, but you're going to have an opportunity to win that game. Although you're not as talented as Illinois up front, with their playing style and how they play football, they're one of those grinded out, hard-nosed football teams. They want to take a lot of time off the clock. So that means that offensively, you can't afford turnovers. You can't afford a lot of mistakes. So I think that's a winnable game for them. If they're able to not get gashed and ran down to the ground, obviously you should be able to beat Northern Illinois and Louisiana Tech. And even before you play Colorado, you're going to open your season on the road against Minnesota. So this schedule isn't the easiest for Nebraska. After they play Illinois, you got Northwestern. That game could go either way. Purdue has a new coach. You probably should be able to win that game. You probably should be able to beat Northwestern. I said that could go either way. You can beat Northwestern. Michigan State, Maryland. Wisconsin, Iowa, you got to close your season off with. And those games can go either way also. It's like when you look at Nebraska's schedule, I don't really think there's any team that I look at this year and say, oh, they got no chance at being able to beat them outside of maybe Minnesota, Michigan, and Maryland. That's about it. I think that every game on Nebraska's schedule is winnable. Now, they probably aren't favorites to win most of these games. They probably won't be favorites going into most of these games. But they do have the capability of being one of those teams that kind of surprises people. They're a good, feel-good story. They get to a bowl game. I at least think that this team is capable, capable of being able to make it to a bowl game with how good Jeff Sims is. And this is a really good wide receiver room. Not great, good wide receiver room. I think this offensive line will improve a little bit. It's not going to be overwhelmingly great, but it's going to be better considering what you've gotten from that position over the last couple of years. So my first year expectations for Matt Rule is that I expect him to make Nebraska a respectable program again in his first season. They're going to be a team that you're no longer going to look on your schedule if you're one of their opponents and say, oh, we play Nebraska, easy win. Nebraska, even though they may not win a whole bunch of one possession games, they're going to be in a bunch of them. They're going to be a team that's going to be tough. They're not going to be a team that you're just easily going to beat unless you just have an overall better team than them like Michigan. So I think year one, Matt Rule can end up winning six games at Nebraska. I'm a really big fan of Jeff Sims. I am a little biased when it comes to him because he's from Duval. You guys already know we got to support our Duval brethren. But you look at Jeff Sims at QB, what they have on offense. I'm not sold on their defense a whole lot. They do have talent on the back end of their secondary. Their linebacker unit is really good. But their defensive line, 
I don't think it's that great, but we'll see how that side of the ball performs. I think that there's a recipe for Nebraska to at least get to a bowl game this year. And I think that would be considerable improvement considering the fact that this is a program that's had some really dark times. You weren't even able to get to a bowl game with Scott Frost. So that would be monumental growth. If you're a Nebraska fan, you'll take that in a heartbeat. Is Kansas State going to repeat as Big 12 champions? Now, they shocked a lot of people when they won the Big 12, upsetting TCU in the Big 12 championship game. And they got a really good squad. And some people say this is the best team that Kansas State has had since 2012. And they got a really good coaching staff. You got Colin Keelan entering his second season as offensive coordinator. And looking at this offense, this should be one of the best offenses in the Big 12 this year. Will Howard comes back at quarterback. He reminds me a lot of Dak Prescott. For those of you guys who watch the NFL and keep up with Dak Prescott, I think Will Howard has a lot of his mannerisms. Really stalky, big, well-built guy. But he's a little bit of an underrated runner. Now, he's not a great runner. He's not overly athletic. But he does have enough mobility that you have to account for. And then he's pretty big as well. So Will Howard has a lot of similarities, in my opinion, to how Dak Prescott plays. He throws a really good deep ball. And when you look at how he played last season, he completed 59% of his passes, 15 touchdowns to four interceptions. He was fantastic. And he has arguably the best offensive line in the Big 12 that's going to be blocking for him this year. And the reason why I say arguably is because it's either between you or Texas. Texas had a really inconsistent offensive line last year, but that's due to the fact that they had a lot of young guys starting. They're going to be having two really good sophomores on that offensive line this year. And their offensive line is going to be really good, or at least it looks really good on paper. Now, Kansas State, they return all their starters from last year. They got a couple of guys on this offensive line who could end up being first-round picks and next year's NFL draft. So this is going to be one of the better offensive lines that you're going to find in all of college football. And at running back, you're asking who's going to replace Deuce Vaughn. Well, I'm glad you asked because I did not know that Trayshawn Ward transferred to Kansas State. I was surprised as hell when I saw Trayshawn Ward pop up on Kansas State's roster. I was like, bro, when the hell did he leave FSU? Y'all have a real dog and Trayshawn Ward at running back. Like, I promise you, Deuce Vaughn was a good player, but there's not going to be a big drop off going from him to Trayshawn Ward. Did you know? Over his last two seasons at Florida State, he was averaging over six yards per carry. Do you know how good you have to be as a running back to average at least six yards per carry? That means every two carries you got, you was averaging a first down. And they already got another good running back right behind him and DJ Giddens. So you look at Kansas at running back, they don't have a dude's Vaughn back there, but they're set at running back with Trayshawn Ward. That's one of their biggest pickups from the transfer portal. And I didn't even know he left Florida State. Well, I knew he left Florida State because he wasn't on the roster, but him ending up at Kansas State is just so random. And that's the crazy thing about the transfer portal. It's like, you never know where the hell certain players are going to end up at. And he's a Florida boy. And one thing you Kansas State fans need to know about Florida boys is that we some dogs. We get it done. You can depend on us. We come through when it matters. So Trayshawn Ward, this is a really explosive running back. He's really good after contact. Really explosive. Has good acceleration. You got a really good pickup in Trayshawn Ward. That's one of the better pickups amongst all the other schools in the Big 12 who are active in the portal this cycle, man. I did not know Trayshawn Ward freaking transferred from FSU to Kansas State. That is crazy. Wow. And when you look at tight end, they got one of the best tight ends in the country and Ben Sinnott or Ben Sinnott. I forgot how they pronounce his name. Forgive me, forgive me. But this is a really good offense, a really good offense. Now, defensively, I got some concerns. Your D-line is going to be pretty good. You got 
a good amount of experience coming back and talent coming back, even though you lead, you lose your leading pass rusher from last year, but your second sack producer returns, who's going to step up behind him? Your cornerback position is a big question mark. You lose two of your best cornerbacks to the NFL. You're going to have two starters replacing them. Now you got Kobe Savage on the back end of the secondary, though. And he was a second team Big 12 selection. This dude is a dog. He's one of those guys that say him. And you definitely don't want to be running around in the middle of the field with him lurking. Because you might end up regretting it. Really good player. Really good safety. So their safety position should be set. They got a North Dakota State transfer that was pretty good as well. So they're secondary. You got concerns at cornerback. But you like what you have at safety, and you think that your defensive line is going to be able to repeat the production that you somewhat had last year. Now, when it comes to the pass rush, that has to improve because even with what you had last year, your pass rush still overall could have been a little bit better. Now, when you look at Kansas State and how they stack up amongst the other teams in the Big 12, I think that they probably are the third best team in this conference walking in. If I had to rank all of my top three Big 12 teams, I would go Texas first, Kansas second, and Kansas State third. And you play Kansas this year. You can very well beat Kansas. I think it's going to be a really entertaining game when you look at how much Kansas returns on offense and defense. They return 91% of their offensive production from last year. And when you look at Texas, They have one of the best rosters in all of college football. So they most definitely are capable of being able to win the Big 12. But Kansas State should be up there again. You have consistency from your head coach. TCU, yeah, I like Sonny Dykes, but we don't know how they're going to look with everything that they lost from last year's team. They don't really have a lot coming back. They had to hit the portal pretty hard. So we don't know how they're going to look. Oklahoma under Brent Venables. I think they are going to be solid. But I don't think they're going to compete for the Big 12. And Texas Tech is a team that's on the rise that you can overlook. But I think that you have a slightly better roster than them, given how great your offensive line is. And when you look at your schedule, it's not difficult. At least your first couple of games, you're playing Southeastern Missouri, Troy, and Mizzou. You should be able to win those three games. And then you enter conference play 3-0 against UCF which I think you can win that one. You go 4-0 coming off your bye week on the road against Oklahoma State, which is a winnable game, and Oklahoma State shouldn't be that good this year. I don't think they're that great. You look at Texas Tech, though, that's going to be one of the biggest games of the season for Kansas State. Texas Tech is one of those programs that are on the rise. They are recruiting at a really high level. They got a really good team. Then you got TCU, Houston, Texas on the road. Baylor, this is... Probably going to be the toughest stretch of your schedule to end the season, Kansas, Iowa State. So I think best case scenario for Kansas State, they go 10-2 and two again. I definitely think you're going to lose to Texas this year, and you probably could have another loss, which comes from Kansas or potentially Texas Tech maybe. But 10-2 and two is my best case scenario for Kansas State. Worst case... I'm going to go with 8-4. and four. I can't see this team winning anything less than eight games. They got a really good team. They're really good up front with really productive quarterback play. Their defense is a little bit of a question mark when you look at them having two new starters at cornerback. How are they going to play? What production are they going to get from that position? But even then, I can't see them winning anything less than eight games. Now, my overall prediction for them... I think I probably have them at 9-3. and three. I think they probably could suffer from an upset. And plus, I still have them losing to Texas. But this is a really good team. This is one of the best teams in the Big 12 entering this season. Great offensive line. Your defensive line should still be pretty good. Your offense could be even better than what it was last year. Even though you don't got a lot of proven production at wide receiver, you do return Phillip Brooks, who was second in receiving yards last year. He also was tied for second in touchdown receptions as well. So there's enough talent for Kansas State to win the Big 12 again, but I don't think they're going to repeat. 
I honestly feel like Texas and Kansas are going to make the Big 12 championship. And that could be a Super Bowl prediction. It could be a wild prediction. But I just think that Texas is just so good. And when you look at Kansas, they had a lot of momentum last season until their star quarterback got injured after they went up 5-0. and So I think Kansas State is going to be a really good team. They do have a good chance to win the Big 12 again. But if you had to ask me yes or no, will they win the Big 12 again? I'm going to have to tell you no. But this is definitely one of the more underrated programs in college football. My bad for that. But this is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. If you haven't already, make sure that you leave a like, subscribe to the channel. We go live every day, Monday through Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Rate us five stars. We're available not just on YouTube. You can find us on Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from. The JT Sports Podcast is available. And I will see you guys next week with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. Have a good weekend.